Hello, good morning everyone. Okay, so uh, welcome to our first uh, tutorial session. All right, uh, I think most of you are here. I think a few are signing in now. Okay, so um, yeah, so all our tutorials are still scheduled to be online. Okay. Um, yeah, so I hope you saw the uh, announcement by Colin that for now we are no longer having the work from home for the uh, labs, all right, uh, because we are allowed a higher number in, uh, in the uh, lab setup, okay. Uh, but again, uh, things can change very fast, right? Uh, cases are rising uh, by quite large numbers in every day. So, um, uh, as much as we enjoy this, uh, let's hope that it can stay as long as possible. Okay. Uh, any point of time, anything changes, we need to revert back. Okay. So um, for now, we do not need to have uh, this work from home arrangement so everybody can come to the lab. Okay. Uh, the other thing is um, uh, again because of the rising cases, uh, it's a high chance that uh, many of uh, many of you or even myself might be. Uh, Sort of designated as a close contact all right, of somebody who is uh, positive. Okay, uh, if you are a close contact, uh, by right, the protocol uh, three says that you just you can still leave your premises if you do the daily ART test. All right, uh, but if you think that you uh, do not want to put others at risk, okay, uh, I mean, for this module, okay, what I can say is you can still choose to uh, work from home. Okay, the Zoom sessions will still be active. Okay, so if you are considered a close contact and you think that you do not want to take the race and you want to stay at home, uh, you are still allowed to do so. Okay, just uh, log into the Zoom uh, and you can work with your teammates. All right, so the greater labs are still based on sub team level. All right, so even if you are working from home, uh, you can still do it. Okay. Okay, so let's, uh, let's get started. Right, so along the way, if you have questions, uh, you want to ask anything, feel free to uh, unmute and ask, or you can put in the chat. Okay. Um, okay so if you put in the chat, it's okay to put for everybody to see. Okay. So that everybody knows the question. And uh, uh, so when I answer, it's also easy for everybody to relate to the response I'm giving. Okay. Yeah. So usually tutorials. Uh, in most cases, should uh, go up to maybe one and a half hours or so. Uh, sometimes maybe a bit longer, all right, but definitely not three hours. Okay, so uh, you can expect that almost all tutorials will end by around eleven. Okay, so um, yeah, let me let me get started here. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes, okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, in between uh, the tutorial questions, I'll also insert some other sort of discussion questions just to um, break the flow a bit and get you all thinking about certain things. All right, uh, I mean, there are a lot of things that I would like to share with you all, all right, about uh, the things that we are doing, but uh, studio time is always a bit tough because everybody is uh, very focused on what you are doing and you want to get it done, uh, especially for greater labs. All right, so uh, tutorial is a time for me to uh, sort of uh, fill those gaps all right, and, and discuss some of those things that I would want you all to, to learn about. Okay, so let's get started with our first tutorial. So in this tutorial, we are covering the two uh, recent topics, which is on the GPIO as well as the uh, uh, interrupts. All right, so we're going to start with GPIO first. Okay, so in this first question, uh, we are told that um, uh, we have, you know, so so we know that we have three ports, okay, available in our microcontroller. All right. Okay, right now. Okay, so we have the where is my okay, 
Okay. Uh, so we have uh, port B over here. We have port C and uh, port D. Okay, so these are three ports we have. All right. Uh, so if you notice port B over here, we only have uh, port B uh, 0 to 5. Okay, 0 to 5. Okay, so 6 and 7 are not available. All right. Uh, so where are 6 and 7? Okay, they are currently mapped to the external crystal oscillator, crystal 1 and crystal 2 for the UNO board. Okay, so uh, I, I hope you all have downloaded the data sheet of the microcontroller, okay? Uh, so for any microcontroller that you're going to deal with, uh, it's always good to download the data sheet and keep it with you on standby, okay? Because uh, anytime you want to refer to anything, the data sheet is always a very good reference point, okay? To uh, go back to and, and figure out things, okay? Um, so let's just look back at the schematic a bit, okay, of this uh, Arduino Uno controller and have a look at uh, how it is designed. Okay, so let me bring that up. So if you download it, you can also open it up. Okay, so this is basically the uh, uh, microcontroller data sheet. Okay, so I hope you have downloaded this. Okay, so it's the 8 mega 328. Okay, so of course, uh, every microcontroller data sheet that you download is, is a few hundred pages. Sometimes it can even go up to a thousand pages. Okay, depending on how complex it is. Um, and nobody expects uh, anyone to know everything, all right? But as long as you have the data sheet, you can zoom in on whatever that is uh, really you want to know and you can sort of uh, extract the important information from that. Okay, so if you have the data sheet, please open it up, all right, uh, on your computer to have a look. Okay, so if you look at the left-hand side, okay, for example, if I want to have an overview of how it is connected, you can go to the block diagram. Okay, so this block diagram here in section four, if you see, it gives you a very nice overview of the microcontroller and the things that we have. Okay, so things like the clock, the ADC, the, the memory, the IO ports and things like that. So this gives you a very nice high level view of how internally everything is connected. Okay, but of course, when we design a system, we don't usually look at uh, this. Okay, we look at the pinout, okay, which is what we have here. Okay, so if you look at the pinout over here, you can see that uh, these are the actual microcontroller pinouts, okay? And how do we know that uh, it is port B7 and 6 is connected to the crystal? Okay, you can see from here, okay? You can see from this section over here that port B, pin 7 and pin 6 are both uh, also multiplexed with a crystal 1 and crystal 2, okay? Um, and you will also notice that almost all pins, okay, except for the power pins, almost all the other pins have a lot of slash, slash, and so on, okay? And the reason why every microcontroller is designed this way is because you want to uh, create a device that is compact and uh, low cost, all right, but at the same time provide a wide variety of features. Okay, of course, you can say, why don't I just create enough pins uh, for all the features that I want? Uh, if you do that, of course, it's possible. Uh, but what happens is your overall footprint, that means your, your size of the microcontroller becomes bigger, all right? Because you need to have enough space to have all the pins, all right? And when your footprint becomes bigger, then the cost also goes up, all right? So it's always a trade-off. Right? So manufacturers have to sort of make a decision, okay, when they design the controller, uh, how you want to do multiplexing and uh, how you want to switch between the various uh, uh, features to allow users to use most of the features, but at the same time, you can minimize the size of the package. Okay, so these are things that you should take note of when you are choosing a microcontroller on your own for your project. Okay, uh, so again, the data sheet, like I said, gives you all this information. So always have this on standby. All right, uh, let's come back here. So the question that we have is, uh, in the Arduino Uno, all right, in Arduino Uno, we already know that this is actually uh, port B, pin seven and pin six, crystal one and crystal two, okay? But uh, in the uh, on the Uno board itself, it is already reserved for the crystal, so you can't have access to it. Okay, but you're always free to create your own board. Okay, uh, in fact, uh, when I was uh, revamping the wire wrapping uh, uh, studio, 
one of my ideas was initially to get you to wire up your own uh, Arduino board. Okay, uh, but then I realized it'll be too, it'll take too much time. Okay, you can't do it in one studio. Okay, so that's why I decided not to do that. Okay, but you can uh, very easily create your own board. Okay, and it's not as complicated as it seems. Okay, so the Uno board looks very complicated. Okay, but actually to create your own board, I can tell you it's very, very easy. You only need the microcontroller, you need power supply, the plus five volt, and you need ground. In fact, that's all you need. It's very, very easy, okay, to create your own microcontroller board, okay? The reason why we have so many things out there on the board is because you still need to have the uh, flexibility to keep downloading the code, okay? So, but let's say you already finalized your design, you want to mass produce it, okay? Uh, you don't need to make changes to your code anymore. All you need to do is plug it out and put it to another board with just the power supply and ground and you just bring out whatever pins you want. Okay, that's all. Okay, even this crystal, okay, is still optional, okay, which is what we're going to discuss now. Okay, so in this question here, they're asking us, uh, is it possible to make use of all the eight bits of port B? That means I want to uh, not use pin seven and pin six for crystal one and crystal two. Is it possible? Okay, so it is possible. Okay, because if you look back at the clocking options, okay, in table 13.1, okay, so you can go back to your data sheet. Okay, table 13.1. Uh, let me bring it out here. Okay, so under chapter 13, system clock and options. So this chapter gives us the overview of all the clocking options available in the controller. Okay, so if you look at this, uh, there is a section called clock sources. Okay, so that means what are all the different options you have uh, if I want to clock my controller. Okay, for any microcontroller to work, basically you need two things. Okay, one is the power, okay, which is what I said. Okay, which is the plus five volt and the crowd. Okay, the other thing is you need a clock. Okay, you need a clock to uh, sort of uh, be the heartbeat of your controller. Okay, uh, in the most boards, they use this external crystal or external clock. Okay, which is what we have for the Uno board. But you can choose not to do that. You can choose an internal clock. Okay, so you can use external clock or you can use external oscillator. Okay, or you can use internal uh, oscillator as well. All right, so when you use an internal oscillator, basically you can free up those two pins. Okay, so port B, pin 7, and pin 6 can be freed up to be used as GPIOs. All right, so that is an option. All right, when you design your own board, okay, uh, of course, what is the trade off? Right, there's always a trade off. So, the trade off is when you decide to choose your own, uh, uh, when you choose the external clock option, you can choose whatever frequency you want. Okay, 8 megahertz, 10 megahertz, 12 megahertz, up to you. Okay, so you have a lot of options. But when I choose an internal oscillator, I only have two options here. All right, so of course, if you say that, okay, this is actually good enough for me. All right, if I run it at 8 megahertz, if the response is fast enough, my system works at that. Then by all means, you can do that. All right, so uh, again, you just need to check to see whether these internal clock frequencies are sufficient for your system. If you feel that it's not, you need a higher clock frequency, then you have no choice, then you have to use the external clock. All right, so that is basically the idea behind this first question here. All right, to understand the flexibility you have. All right, so you're not limited by what you have on the Uno board. Okay, the Uno board is just a development board. Okay, what you are interested in is actually the Ad Mega 328, which is a microcontroller. All right, so what we want to know is what can I do with the controller? Okay, without being limited by the Uno board. Okay, so of course, there are other factors to consider frequency. Okay, some of you may think, okay, if my microcontroller can go up to 20 megahertz, for example, then why don't I just straight away use a 20 megahertz crystal for my design? The faster, the better, right? Uh, again, of course, a high frequency means your code can run faster, you process things faster, but there's always an issue with power consumption. Uh, this is a very important factor, all right? Uh, because of the fact that most microcontrollers are generally targeted towards embedded systems, all right? So a very simple system, for example, your aircon remote control. 
Okay, I think your aircon remote control, you probably can't even remember when was the last time you changed the battery. Okay, because you change the battery one time, it probably can last one year or so. All right, because it consumes very, very little power. Okay, you can't imagine using an aircon control where every one week you have to change the battery. All right, because it keeps running at such a high frequency for no reason. Okay, so you want to reduce the power consumption as much as possible. All right, then of course, when you run a high frequency, sometimes you also have stability issues. Okay. Uh, again, this depends on how complex the system is, whether the race conditions and things like that. Okay. Uh, in terms of implications to the code, all right. Uh, again, this is important because uh, if you, for example, you write the code, okay, uh, thinking that your main clock, okay, your F clock is at 20 megahertz, all right, then you do a lot of calculation, correct? Right? to do some delay, to do some sampling. Okay, so these are things we will cover in future studios. All right. Uh, but if later on, after you write all the code and do everything, you decide to change your clock frequency. You say 20 megahertz is too high. Maybe I drop it down to maybe 12 megahertz. Okay, your code will still work. But what happens is you then need to make sure that all these uh, timing related uh, peripherals, uh, calculations that you did, uh, before need to be relooked at, okay, because they may no longer be valid. Okay, so these are implications of the code uh, that you need to uh, take into consideration. Okay, now let's look at the GPIO configuration. Okay, in our studio, we configured the LED as active high. Okay, that means we apply a logic to turn it on, a logic one to turn it on, and zero to turn it off. So if you remember, uh, basically, if this is the pin. Okay, the Actify configuration means the anode is connected to the GPIO, the cathode is connected to ground to a resistor. Okay, so when I put a logic one is equivalent to five volt. Okay, so five volt and ground, so the current will flow and light up the LED. All right, so now what I want is to do the reverse, draw a circuit connection to connect an LED in active low. So when I say is active low means the low that means a uh, logic zero will turn on the LED and one will turn off the LED. Okay, so how do I do that? That means I just need to flip this around. All right, that means the same thing, the pin is here. Okay, now I want a zero to light up the LED. So if I want a zero to light up the LED, okay, it is connected this way, okay, with the resistor and plus five volt here. Okay, so when I put a logic zero, that means it's considered zero volt, then the current will flow this way to light up the LED. Okay, so it is uh, something that you should know, all right, uh, from uh, your EPP1 itself, all right, whatever circuits you have built before. Okay, so active high or active low. So either way, as long as your hardware and software are in sync, you will work. All right, so usually when you have issues in the studio, things not working, you always need to check both sides, correct? Whether is it the hardware that is configured or wired wrongly, or the software is written, but it doesn't match the hardware that you have designed. Okay, so as long as you understand that you need to sync up both of it, then you should be able to figure out uh, if there's any issue. Okay, the resistor doesn't matter whether it's in front or behind, because they're all in series. Okay, so whether you put the resistor in front or behind doesn't matter, it's the same. Okay, so if you remember in series circuit, the same current flows through all the components. Okay, so it makes no difference uh, how you place them around in a series uh, connection. Okay, so in this, uh, so that is the circuit we have designed, all right? Uh, and now we want to control the DDRB register. Okay, so let's uh, look at the circuit again. So the circuit is this. Uh, this is a pin. Okay, you have a LED here and you have a register and plus five volt. Now write the code to set the DDRB register. So in this case, the pin here, should it be considered as an input pin or output pin? Can anybody tell me? Is it considered an input pin or output pin? 
Okay, so it should be considered as an output. Correct. Okay. So it doesn't matter whether it's active or active file. The input or output is basically relating to what are you doing with the pin. If I say that I want to do a read, okay, then it is considered an input. If I want to do a write, then it's considered output. In this case, to control this LED, I need to write to this pin. Okay, so I either write a zero or write a one. So since I'm writing to the pin to control the behavior, it is supposed to be a output pin. Okay, so it, it always relates back to what are you doing? Are you actually reading the value on the pin or are you writing to the pin? Okay, so that is uh, the GPIO configuration. Okay, so when you are doing it this way, we say that the microcontroller is syncing current. Okay, so what do you mean by syncing current? That means when I switch on, that means if I put a zero here, that means zero volt, the current is now going to flow into the pin. That means going into the microcontroller. Okay, so it's syncing current. So if it is syncing current, okay, now you need to be careful about what is the maximum syncing current, okay, when the device is operating at five volts. Okay, so what is the maximum syncing current? Okay, that can go in. So this again, you need to look back at the data sheet. So if you look back at table 32 in the data sheet, the answer is 20 milliampere. Okay, now this uh, 20 milliampere basically means that when I put an output low voltage, okay, the current that flows in, okay, that means from the pin perspective, okay, the current that flows in can be maximum of 20 milliampere. All right, but this, it doesn't stop here. You still need to look at this node 4, okay, so there is a node there, node 4, and what does it inform us? It informs us that even though you can sync 20 milliampere, there is still another layer of limitation that when you sum up the sinking current they, for different pins, they should not exceed a certain value. Okay, so for example, if let's say I decide to choose B0 to B5. Okay, so let's say I say port, Z, port B and 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And all I with I want to sink current. All right, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six of them together. And six of them all go into uh, sinking at the same time, what will happen? Six times 20, I'll get 120 million here. Okay, which exceeds the limit here. All right, that means even though I can configure all of these pins as uh, to be sinking current, I cannot make all of them sink at the same time. Okay, because the sum Okay, of this for this particular group of pins should not exceed 100 milliampere. Okay, so again, these are all uh, things that sometimes we overlook, right? Because we build the circuit, uh, it works and we are happy, all right? Uh, but sometimes uh, if you do not factor in this, okay, you can cause potential damage to the microcontroller. Okay, so uh, again, that's where the data sheet and looking at these small, small details helps us, all right, to prevent uh, things from going wrong. Okay, so again, this is a very simple thing. Just a recap of our, our circuit principles from EPP1. So we know that the voltage drop across the LED is 0.7 volt. All right, so how do I choose an appropriate resistor value? Okay, so I think this should be very easy for all of you. So you just apply your ohm's law. All right, V equals to IR. So the resistance should be phi minus 0 0.7. So if you look at it, it's basically five volt resistor and this. Okay, so here we know that this voltage drop is 0 0.7 volt. All right, and the maximum current. So this is instead of ground, in this case, this ground is actually your microcontroller pin. Okay, so the current is not going to flow into the microcontroller pin, and I want this current to be limited to. 20 milliampere. 
Okay, so what is the resistor that I must choose? Okay, so the resistor must be based on the voltage drop across here. So if 0 0.7, 0 0.7 is here, so 4.3 volt has to be dropped across the resistor. So the minimum value of the resistor should be 250 ohms. Okay, some of you may say, if I choose a smaller resistor, your LED very bright, wow, feel very shocked. Then after a while, what happened is see some smoke coming out of here. And that's it, not shock anymore. Okay, so always be careful. Huh? Of course, a, a nice and bright LED is nice to look at. Okay, but uh, if you do not factor in these resistor values, okay, you can potentially damage the controller. Okay, the five volts, does it have to be external or Arduino? It can be external or can be the Arduino five volts as well. Okay, so this five volt can come from anywhere, doesn't matter. Okay, so just uh, some more discussion. Uh, how much is the source current? Okay, so just now we looked at the sinking current. Now, how about the source current? That means if I go back to say that I want to put in active high configuration, so this way. Okay, so uh, a logic one is equivalent to five volt, so the current is flowing in this direction. Okay, so how much is this current? Okay, so the value is 20 milliampere, again from the data sheet. The absolute maximum is 40 milliampere. That means if your device tries to draw more current, the maximum you can supply is 20 milliampere. Sorry, 40 milliampere. Okay, but by default, it is 20 milliampere. Okay, now what if your device uh, wants more? Okay, so is 20 milliampere enough? Okay, so again, it depends on what you're trying to do. Okay. In most of the simple experiment, let's say you're just controlling an LED and so on, then it is fine. If you're trying to interface to a motor, then it may not be enough. All right, so that is why if you recall EPP1, okay, the you need to have a motor driver circuit connected with the additional power supply, okay, to provide the voltage and the current that you need to drive the motor. Okay, and we are going to do that uh, also for this. Uh, EPP2, all right, when we come to the motor part. Okay, so that sort of gives you some idea on uh, where uh, these current discussions are. So even though we uh, generally overlook this, right, because most of the time, as long as they really light up, we are fine. We see the, the simple motor moving, we are fine, all right? But again, these are important things to consider uh, when you are as in trying to design something that you want to last for a long time uh, and or you want to market a product, you want to, to work on some startup and things like that. So all these small, small things matter. Okay, so let me uh, diverge a bit. Okay, uh, so I'm going to do a simple poll here just to see whether everybody understands. Okay, so you can open up your browser and go to this polev.com slash rsnus to give your answer here. So the AD328P is a how many bit microcontroller? Okay, so it looks like a so initially thirty two bit was leading, but now eight bit is leading. Okay, um, okay, so the majority of you chose uh, eight bit. 
Okay, so what is the answer? Okay, so the answer is actually, if you go back to your data sheet, okay, you go back to your data sheet, all you need to do is go to the first page. Okay, 8 bit controller. Okay, so the very first line that you see on your data sheet already give you the answer. It's an 8 bit controller. All right, so again, uh, what, what do you mean by 8 bit or 32 bit or 64 bit? Okay, so generally, when we say it's an 8 bit controller, okay, it means that you can deal with 8 bit at a time, okay, uh, and all your registers are 8 bit. So if you just look back at your the studio so far, you can see that whenever we write to any of the registers, it's always 8 bits. Okay, the registers we deal with are 8 bit, the data we deal with is 8 bit. All right, so it sort of tells you that this is an 8 bit controller. You have to deal with a 32 bit microcontroller, okay, uh, which you will do in uh, yeah, 2271, then everything is 32 bit. That means your registers are 32 bit, your data is 32 bit and so on. Okay, so again, it's just a very simple way of looking at it. Okay, as long as you are dealing with 8 bit data, then it's 8 bit, if it's 16 bit, then it's uh, 16 bit uh, controller and so on. Okay, so let me look at your questions. Okay, so okay, how, to, how does it work? Uh, in active flow okay so let me just show that again okay so in active flow configuration basically what we are saying is your gpio pin is connected to the cathode. Okay, so if you imagine, okay, if you imagine the same circuit, okay, the same circuit I, I redraw here. Okay, if I want the current to flow and light up the LED, then this must be connected to ground. All right, because potential current flows from a higher potential to a lower potential. Okay, so if I want current to flow and light up the LED. This must be a ground, so it is considered on. Okay, if I do not want the current to flow, okay, then what must I do? That means this cathode must also be connected to plus five volt, so there is no current flow. Okay, I is zero, so the LED is off. So in this case, the on is considered as logic zero, the off is considered as logic one. Okay, so that is how the active flow works. Yeah, so I think one of your classmates, uh, Matthew also answered. Okay, so basically it is the flow of current from higher potential to lower potential. Okay, so when I say it is, uh, on, that means it is basically zero. So the current flows from, from the five volts to the ground. If it is off, that means it's a five volt. So five volt to five volt, there is no current flow. So it's considered off. Okay, so let's go to the last part here on the, on the last question on the first part, power consumption. Okay, so uh, yeah, last in the past, we had a separate studio on power consumption, but I think now we have to take it out okay, because of the reduction in the hours. Okay, so power consumption is again in most uh, cases is always an afterthought, all right? Uh, because we don't usually think it's important, but actually, like I said, it's very very important. I mean, even as a student, I mean, most of the time, as long as your project works, you know, uh, you're happy, you're good, you know. But uh, power consumption is important, all right, and we want to uh, minimize the power consumption as much as possible. Okay, so what are the ways in which we can do it? All right, so one way is always to put your device in standby mode, okay, when it's not doing anything useful, just like a handphone. All right, if you leave it untouched for a while, it goes to a low power mode, the screen shuts off, and things like that. So it's just automatically designed to conserve power as much as possible. Okay, so how can I do it? All right, at the controller level. So I need to sort of look into some of the registers and so on. 
Okay, so one of it is basically what we call the sleep mode control register. Okay, so in your microcontroller, there is a sleep mode control register that allows you to go down or go into a different mode of power. All right, so the details, we're not discussing here, but this question is more to give you the awareness that these are the things we have. All right, uh, and then of course, if you are free, you can always try it out in the lab. All right, so you have like power down, power save, standby mode, extended standby, and so on. Okay, so there are a lot of different modes. Of course, when you put it in different modes of uh, low power, some things work, some things don't work, and only certain events may wake up the controller. Okay, so these are things, the details that you must uh, read from the data sheet. All right, but there's this register called speed mode control register where you can control uh, or set these uh, bits to decide on the settings. Okay, so if you are in standby mode, okay, how can I wake up? Just like a handphone. When your handphone goes to a sleep mode, okay, how do you wake it up? Okay, sometimes you touch the screen, it might wake up. Sometimes you must press the power button, then it wakes up. Okay, so something happens, then it wakes up. Okay, so again, these are the events that sort of uh, wake up the system. All right, so for example, okay, these are, of course, all uh, reset related. Okay, this is uh, uh, some data incoming data okay uh, these are basically things that you are more you can relate to these are basically external events okay an external event can be simple as a switch okay so like how you connected the switch in the last studio you can connect a switch to generate an interrupt okay so when i press the switch then it sends an interrupt and it wakes up the device all right, so from a low power mode, you can wake up and go to a full, uh, full uh, operational mode. Okay, how many clock cycles? Again, this is just to give you uh, some idea how it works. It takes six clock cycles. All right, so again, wh why is this? Okay, so of course, these are just taken from the data sheet. Okay, but why is this question here? Okay, because it takes time. Right, when you wake up a device. Okay, from a low power or sleep mode to a full operational mode, it is not instantaneous. Okay, it takes some time to come to a level where it can start to process. Okay, just like your laptop or your handphone or whatever. You put your laptop to sleep mode and then you try to wake it up. Okay, you log in and so on. You can't immediately uh, start doing work. Okay, it, it takes some time to fully uh, sort of wake up all the subsystem and then you can uh, sort of get the full capabilities available. All right, so in this question, we are just giving you an example, okay, how you can reduce the power consumption based on what we call subsystem clocking. All right, so in this example, we are saying that, okay, you are designing a project where you do not need to use the ADC module, okay? So your whole project, you're not using the ADC module. So even though it is there in the controller, it is consuming power, but you're not using it. So how can I disable it? All right, so that is actually uh, done through this register called power reduction register. So this is another name for this that you might see in other references, what is what you call clock gating. Okay, so when you say clock gating, what are we saying? That means we can choose to cut off the clock to individual peripheral subsystems. Okay, so when we cut off the clock, what happens? It stops working. Okay, so I can say, okay, for example, I'm not using the ADC. So I cut off the clock to the ADC. I'm not using the timer one module. I cut off the clock to the timer one module. All right, so you can individually choose to cut off clocks to peripheral subsystem to reduce the overall power consumption. Okay, so these are, of course, uh, techniques available and it also depends on the controller you're dealing with. Okay, some controllers may have more features, some may have lesser features, and so on. Okay, disabling ADC via, there's a question. What if you disable ADC via its own control and status registers? Okay, so when you disable the ADC, okay, so when you disable the ADC, the ADC is not uh, functioning, okay, but the clock is still supplied. Okay, because the moment the Arduino Uno powers up, I mean the microcontroller powers up, the all the subsystem receive the clock to start functioning. 
Okay, by default, that is how the uh, controller is designed. Okay, so for this controller, if you want to, to fully shut off the ADC, you need to cut off the clock. When you disable the ADC from the ADC registers, you are just disabling the, the, the functionality only, but the clock is still there. Okay, so the clock gating is the, 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 the ideal way if you really do not want that subsystem or that peripheral to consume any power. So you totally cut out the clock. Okay, again, these are all very specific to the controller you're using. Okay, uh, again, when you go to 2271, okay, you will look at another more advanced controller and then you have uh, different ways of doing this power consumption and management and so on. Okay, so it all depends on the controller you're dealing with. Yeah, so it's like power reversion register all with the one. Yeah, correct. And so you do a all with the one bit to cut off the power to that particular controller, uh, that particular peripheral. Okay, so further discussion on power consumption. Okay, so these are again things related to uh, consumer products and you want to market the product. Okay, so things like battery life, electricity bill. Okay, I think nowadays uh, it is quite common, okay, uh, or mandatory in fact, that uh, many of the uh, products that you see on uh, ele electrical products, okay, let's say you want to buy a fridge or a washing machine or whatever, okay, you always have this uh, number of ticks, there's a sticker that correct, it tells you how power efficient the product is. Okay, so all of this is important, right? You want to um, get as many ticks as possible to, to show how uh, low the power consumption is going to be, okay? Because that affects your electricity bill. Okay, another thing is uh, this thing called energy stuff. Okay, so if uh, you're working on consumer products, okay, like uh, printers or, or scanners or things like that, okay? There is another certification called energy stuff. All right, where you need to meet the requirements of power consumption. Okay, then you get the energy star sticker. Okay, and some countries are actually very, very strict about it. Okay, some countries are very, very strict such that if you do not even meet their basic energy uh, certification standards, you will not be allowed to sell your product in that country. Okay, so some countries are very, very strict about it. Okay, so again, these are things that you need to factor in Okay, uh, when you want to commercialize a product, you want to sell it to the market and things like that. Okay, uh, let me have another poll before we go for a break. The Arduino Uno bot has a how many megahertz crystal uh, clock? In those of you from my EPP1 class, I think I have showed, I have showed this before, I think. Or I've discussed this before in the lab. Okay, so the vast majority are sticking with the 16 megahertz option. Okay. Um, okay, so there's of course another variation to this question. Okay, so let me let me just show you. Okay. Uh, where's my okay? So on the Table here, you can see two Arduino Uno bots. Is there a difference? Can anybody tell me what is the difference between the two? Don't tell me the color. Huh? Of course, the color is different. Okay, but what is the main difference? Okay, both, both got chip. Uh, both got chip. Okay, for the, this one, this is the chip here, and for this, this is the chip over here. Okay, so let me just tell you, uh, the simple answer is, one is original, one is made in China. Okay? 
That is the main difference. Okay, the one on the left, okay, the green one is the original one. Okay, why is it original? Because in the original, you see the made in Italy. Okay, so this is the original one. Okay, if you were to buy uh, in Singapore locally, I think it's about $25 or something. The one over here is the one that is made in China. Okay, uh, if you buy from AliExpress, it's about $2 or $3, but it works yet as well. Okay, so I have quite a lot of these bought from China. So far, they are working well. All right. Um, again, it's up to you. So of course, uh, the pig, the as what as one of you pointed out, the chip is different. Okay, the chip is different in the sense that the packaging is different. Okay, so if you look back at the data sheet, okay. Uh, let me see where they. Uh, yeah. So you can see there are different types of packaging available. Okay. The one over here is what we call the QFP package. Okay. Can anybody know? Tell me what is uh, QFP? Does anybody know? So there's two packaging. Okay. The one on the right just now was QFP package. Okay. The other one was uh, the, the standard one that you know, which is just the DIP package. Okay. So these are two common terms you'll come across, okay? DIP stands for dual inline package. Okay, they call it dual inline because it's like two lines side by side. Okay, the QFP package, okay, is basically what you call the uh, quad flat package. Okay, it's quad because it's all four sides and it's flat. Okay, so it's quad flat package. Okay, so that is why you have the two different design. And it also makes a difference, it also makes a difference because uh, the quad flat package actually has, uh, I think, two additional pins that are brought out, which the DIP package doesn't have. Okay, uh, so it does make a difference if you want to have access to those two additional pins. Okay, and the, the reason why I want to show you this is because uh, if you look at the actual Arduino Uno, okay, the crystal, okay, is this uh, silver color thing over here. Okay, uh, and if you look there, there's a number there written. Okay. And that number is what, 16. Okay, which is 16 megahertz. Okay, that means the original Arduino Uno is used to 16 megahertz. Whereas if you use the, this one from uh, China, it's running at uh, 12 megahertz. Okay, so again, this is all important things, all right, because if you work on your uh, project using the original board, all right, but then you decide to mass produce using the China board. Again, the clock frequency has changed. So all of these things need to be re-looked at. Okay, so uh, the original, uh, uh, what do you call it? The original um, board has a crystal of 16 megahertz. Okay, but if you were to take any other third-party board, all right, from another manufacturer, then you might have 12 megahertz, you might have uh, 8 megahertz or, or 4 megahertz and so on. Okay, so again, take note of this if you decide to buy a board uh, that is not the original. Okay, you need to really check what is the clock frequency. Okay, uh, so let's go for a short break. Okay, now it's 9.52. Let's come back at 10 o'clock. Okay, or 10. Okay, let's give a bit more. 10.05. Okay, take about 10 minutes break. 10.05, I'll see you all back here. And then we will start on the part two. Okay, uh, if you have any questions, you can put in the chat first. Okay, later I'll address those questions. Okay, so I'll see you all back here at 10.05. Okay, so I'll come back. Uh, let's, let's continue from uh, the slides. Okay, so if ever there's a, a disconnection, you know, and I drop out of the call, just stay on. Okay, uh, uh, I will join back in and then we can resume. Okay, so uh, in case I get dropped off uh, before the end of the lesson. Okay, so can you see the screen? Yes, okay, thank you. Okay, so now let's go on to the part two, okay, of the uh, 
uh, tutorial, which is on the interrupts. Okay, so before we go to the questions, uh, let's talk about this volatile uh, keyword. Okay, so this was actually there in the studio, okay, but uh, I think uh, I didn't want to explain it in the studio because everybody was uh, too engrossed uh, in because it's a greater studio and everybody was uh, trying to get things done. Okay, so I didn't explain this in the studio. So I want to sort of fill that in now. All right. Uh, so if you look back in your studio, uh, later I'll show you the code. There is a variable that we declare and we use a volatile keyword. Okay. Uh, so what is this volatile keyword all about? Okay, why do we need to use it? Okay, so let's look at this code over here. All right. So when I declare, uh, uh, when I write my code and I do this integer x equals to zero, okay, when I compile my code, when I compile my code, what will happen is uh, the compiler will set aside some memory location. Okay, so this is some memory location. So let's say zero x a zero zero zero. So this is the address where this uh, uh, variable is allocated to and I put a value of zero inside. Okay, now, Inside my code, I am executing this line over here, okay, where I have a loop and I say x equals to x plus one. Now, when I write any piece of code in C, okay, uh, of course, in, in other modules, you will learn this, all right. If effectively, what happens is you are translating it, okay, to two steps, okay, or, or to the machine code, but ultimately, your computer only recognizes binary. Okay, that means ones and zeros. Okay, and that is basically what we call the machine code. Okay, so, but instead of directly translate, translating into machine code, there is an intermediary step called the assembly language code. Okay, so you will learn assembly language coding in another module. Okay, but it's basically an intermediary code uh, that is more readable, all right, and relates uh, more directly with the hardware, of the or the microprocessor architecture we are dealing with okay and from the assembly language we can easily translate to machine code okay now a processor in general okay when it comes to executing instructions uh has three cycles okay so if this is my processor and i want to execute this instruction or any instruction there are basically three steps that it goes through okay the three steps are what we call f D and E. Okay. Does anybody know what are these three steps? Okay, you may have heard it uh, somewhere. F, D, and E. Okay, of course, you can break it down to or, or go deeper into five steps, but at a very general level, you call it F, D, E. Okay, which is basically fetch, decode, and execute. All right, so that is basically all that the processor is doing. Okay, for every instruction that you write, it fetches the instruction, it decodes the instruction, and it executes the instruction. Okay, so that is what is happening. Okay, so when I say I want to e e execute this code over here, x equals to x plus one, I need to fetch this instruction, decode the instruction, and execute the instruction. Okay, now memory access. Uh, is very slow compared to processor. Okay, if you uh, look back historically, okay, processor speed has always been able to uh, either double up or go 1.5 times every year or so. Okay, so the processor speed has always been increasing, or at least in the last 15 to 20 years, it has always been increasing at a very high rate. Okay, but memory speed is always uh, is still improving, but at a much slower rate. Okay, so that is why the memory access is always very slow compared to processor. So the processor can always execute instruction very fast. But what happens? It's still waiting for the memory to respond. Okay, it has, still has to wait. Okay, so like, uh, I mean, those of you with NS, you know what we say, lah, right? You rush to wait, wait to rush. Okay, so that's the same concept here. Okay, so the processor will rush and do things very fast, but then you have to wait because the memory has not replied yet. Okay, so to um, minimize the effect of a slow memory, okay, what the processor does, it actually creates a local copy of the variables to speed things up. Okay, 
So what it does is, uh, it takes a copy of the variable, okay, and keeps it in the internal register. Okay, let's say we call it register seven, and it does this computation. So here, what you'll do is you'll say register seven plus one, okay, and put the result maybe back into register seven or some other register, okay. So it will do the computation and everything within the register itself. Okay, and after everything is done, then you will finally write it back to the memory. Okay, so this is again something that is transparent to us because it's handled by the compiler. Which register it chooses, when it decides to use this approach, it all is left to the compiler to decide. Okay, so that is basically what is happening when you write your code. So even though in your code, you have all these variable names, all right, ultimately you will get translated down to registers at the assembly language code, okay? Now, if I look at this code over here, all right, uh, on the left-hand side, you see the main loop code and here you have the ISR code. Okay, now what happens is the compiler, when it does this translation of the C to the assembly, it also wants to, I mean, it's designed to be smart. Okay, the compiler is designed to be smart. That means it tries to optimize the usage of the code to minimize unnecessary work. Now, if I look at this code over here, what do you see? You see that over here, I initialize the variable. That means I call a zero here. And over here, what do I do? Is this a read operation or a write operation? X equal, equal to zero. Are you reading from X or are you writing to X? Can anybody tell me? This is a reading operation, all right? It means you're reading the value of X and you're comparing it with value zero. Okay, and then based on that, you are performing this loop. Okay, so this loop is based on this condition being fulfilled. Okay, now, in this entire code over here, is there any instruction that updates X, that writes a value to X? There is no instruction, all right? You initialize it, and subsequently, you just read from it, okay? So when the compiler sees this code, okay, when the compiler sees this code, what will it do, okay? now? Let's look at it from the uh, assembly language level. Huh? So what happens is it will, at some earlier point in, in the code, it will state that, okay, I will take the value of X and put into register seven. Okay, and uh, subsequently over here, what will I do? I will use register seven equal, equal to zero. Okay, and then this is where the loop is. All right, this is the while loop. And after that, this is the place after the loop. Okay, so in terms of translating it to assembly language, okay, what happens is the code will look something like this. That means somewhere in the beginning, I will take the actual value from the memory and I'll create a local copy in my register. And subsequently, I will only access the register. Okay, why will I only access the register? Because there is no write operation in my, in my loop over here. So since there is no write operation, that means nobody has updated this value. So I don't need to read from X again. Okay, so the compiler is actually smart, but right? it is trying to optimize the, the code for you. And, and it looks at the code and says, hey, nobody is writing to x. So if nobody is writing to x, then there is no way that the x value can change. And since the x value cannot change, then why must I keep reading from the memory? I just read from the register. Okay, so that is the thinking behind the compiler's uh, decision. And it works well. Okay, but the problem is we have now an interrupt that is updating x. And the link between the ISR and the variable and the main loop is not captured by the compiler. Okay, so the compiler is not going to link and say that the ISR may update the X. It just looks at the code 
at that point of time. All right. So now what happens is if I this event occurs and I jump to this ISR and I update the value X. Okay, what happens? This value is updated. But what happens? In my main loop, I'm only looking at register 7. And register 7 was updated with X in the very beginning. Okay, so that is the sort of loophole here. Okay, so even though this idea of using the local registers work, okay, but when I have an ISR that is updating the variable, okay, and when that update happens, it is not captured in the main loop, okay, because the main loop is compiled, uh, I mean, the compiler using is using a register to access the variable value instead of taking the updated value from the ISR. All right, so how do we go about solving this issue? We go about solving this issue by using the volatile keyword. All right, so what does the volatile keyword do? When you say volatile, you are telling the compiler that this variable, okay, volatile integer x, that means this variable x now is able to be updated beyond the scope of the code that we see here, all right? And when you use the water keyword, what it does is it ensures that every time I access the variable X, I will perform this action. That means I will not depend on the previously loaded register value. I will always take the updated value from the memory. So what will happen is because I use this volatile keyword, before I execute this line, I will actually have another line that will say that I will do one more time of X to register seven. Then I will compare. Okay, so that is what the volatile will do. That means every time I access the variable X, I will always take the updated value from the memory and put it to my register before using it. Okay, so that is something, again, uh, probably new. Okay, you might not have seen this uh, before. Okay, and why it is important is because of the interrupt. Okay, uh, and the fact that the interrupt changes this variable beyond the scope of what we see in the main code that is using the variable. Okay, of course, having said that, uh, there will be cases where you will see that, hey, I never use the volatile, but it still works. How come? Okay, so there will be cases where you never use volatile and yet it works. Okay, so why it works, it could be for a few reasons. Okay, it could be because maybe in your main code, there are other places where X is used. All right, and maybe because of the way X was used, the compiler was able to get the updated value. All right, and of course, at the same time, it could also be that for some reason, the compiler did not use this register update uh, at that point of time for that variable. Okay, so the compiler decision is based on how the compiler is written. Okay, so sometimes even though you do not use the volatile keyword, it may still work, but of course, that is not an excuse not to use it. Okay, as long as you have this kind of situation, where you have a variable updated in the ISR and you need to use that variable in the main code, you should use the volatile keyword. Okay, even though, okay, and sometimes you may work without it. Okay, it is still advisable to use it. Okay, so does volatile make things slower? Okay, I mean, it is not say slower, it is just one additional access that you have to do. All right, so it will not cause uh, uh, anything significant that you will notice. All right, but it is, I think, more than uh, that one additional memory access. The fact that you can actually get the correct value or the correct data is probably the more important thing, correct? Because uh, the one memory access is not going to cause any significant impact, okay? But because of that volatile keyword, you can ensure that you are getting the correct data and you're dealing with the correct values. Okay, so this is basically uh, why we had the volatile keyword, okay? Okay, better. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. Yeah, so this is basically your code. Okay, so this is the code from your studio. Okay, so if you look at it, you declare the on off variable as a uh, volatile. Okay, and basically your main loop is depending on this variable on off, but your on off is updated inside the ISR. Okay, so in order to make sure that this on off is updated correctly, okay, and not uh, based on some old register value, you put in the volatile keyword. Okay, so that is just to recap the studio part and the volatile keyword, okay, that we had seen. Okay, uh, so let's come to the questions here. So the questions here, um, so the, the question, uh, or the first question, question four, uh, again, this is a common uh, thing that uh, most students get confused about. Uh, how do you interpret the word megabyte or, or kilobyte or things like that, okay? So when we talk about memory, okay, we relate it to two power. Okay, when you talk about speed, okay, or bandwidth, we talk about it in 10 power. Okay, so that is how. So because more, when we talk, we always say megabyte, okay, megabyte per second and so on. So this megabyte is calculated differently when we talk about the memory or the storage. Whereas when the same megabyte per second, we talk about it in terms of bandwidth is, 10, 10 power. Okay, so that is basically the two things that you just need to be careful about, okay, based on the terminology we use. Okay, so let's uh, look at this question. So this question and the next question is basically to look at uh, uh, calculating the transfer time, okay, uh, for different uh, methods. Okay, so the first one that we're going to do is the polling method. All right, so the polling method is basically uh, where you keep checking for some event, correct? When the event happens, then you take some action. If not, you keep waiting. All right. And of course, it is the most uh, inefficient way to handle stuff because uh, you're really wasting processor uh, resources and, and, and battery life, uh, just waiting and, and pulling for things to happen. Okay. So if you look at this example, we are given that the throughput is one megabyte per second, okay, which means that one byte is transferred every one microsecond. Okay, at the same time, we are also told that the clock speed is at 50 megahertz. Okay, so in terms of the time, okay, it is uh, 20 nanoseconds per cycle, per clock cycle. All right, so one microsecond is uh, 1000 nanoseconds. Okay, so in terms of number of cycles per byte of transfer. Okay, so, for one byte, okay, you need one microsecond. Okay, so in terms of the number of cycles, it is 50 cycles per byte. Okay, that means I need 50 clock cycles to transfer one byte of data. All right, based on the information we have. And this 50 cycles, okay, per byte transfer is done where? Okay, it is spent in the while loop doing nothing. All right, so you spend a total of 50 cycles per byte, okay, just doing nothing, okay, because you're waiting, all right, because your clock speed is much faster than the throughput, okay, so you're waiting for 50 cycles just to transmit one byte, okay, so when the 50 cycles are up, then the next byte is ready, then the next byte is ready, and so on. Okay, so you spend a lot of time just waiting in that loop, okay, doing nothing. All right, so imagine for one byte, I waste 50 cycles. So for 50, uh, sorry, for 16 kilobytes of data, you waste total of 819, 200 cycles. So that's a lot of clock cycles wasted, okay, doing absolutely nothing while just waiting for the device to be ready, for the drive to be ready. Okay, so again, this example is to show you how inefficient this polling is, all right? Because you spend a lot of time uh, waiting for something to happen. Okay, so it is not uh, a very uh, efficient way of doing things. 
Okay, so that is where the interrupt concept comes in. Okay, so you recall the whole idea of interrupts is that I set up the interrupt to capture the event. When the event happens, I am able to quickly respond and go ahead and, and, and service the interrupt. Okay, and once I'm done, I can go back and carry on from my laptop. Okay, so instead of waiting 50 cycles, you can actually do something else during the 50 cycles. Okay, so you don't need to be stuck in a while loop. So you just carry on doing other stuff. Okay, but the moment the interrupt is triggered, okay, that means the byte has, has come through, okay, then the, the interrupt service routine can be executed. All right, so we are just giving an example here. So let's assume you take about 50 nanoseconds to process an interrupt. So it's two and a half plus cycle. Okay, uh, so what are we doing for this 50 nanosecond? Uh, we will talk about it later on in another question. Okay, how do we handle the interrupt of interrupt processing? We will look at it in a later question. What we are looking at now is this. So if I take about 50 nanoseconds to process one interrupt and I have 16 kilobytes of data, so I need a total of 40,960 cycles in terms of uh, the total time needed to perform the full data transfer. Okay, so with that, you can see that I waste very, very little time. Okay, in fact, you can say you waste almost nothing because you do not do things because you're waiting for something. Okay, you're always busy doing something because when the data is not available, you can use that time to do other things. When the data is available, you process the data. Okay, using the interrupt. So you're always doing something productive instead of just waiting around for something to happen. Okay, the last thing, okay, so this one is not covered uh, here, all right, uh, in detail, uh, because we just want to introduce you to the idea, okay, but we will again discuss this a bit more uh, in 271. The other way of doing data transfer is what we call using the DMA, okay, what we call the direct memory access, okay. To do DMA uh, transfer, you need what is known as a DMAT or DMA controller. So this is basically a hardware, just like how you have GPIO hardware, timer hardware, ABC hardware. You need a DMA controller hardware to be built into your chip in order to perform DMA operations. Okay, the Arduino Uno doesn't have a DMA controller, all right, uh, but a bit more higher end. I think the uh, Mega and, and so on, those uh, Arduino chips have the uh, DMA inside. Okay, so the whole idea of a DMA controller is that it takes over the buses. All right, so if you look at it, okay, for the processor to communicate, okay, with uh, memory and subsystems, there are three buses that it needs. Okay, uh, can anybody tell me what are the three buses of the processor needs? To communicate with the memory or to IO or anything else. Does anybody know what are the three buses? Okay, so if you don't know, I'll tell you. The three buses that you need are what you call the address, data, and control. So that is basically summarized or sort of grouped together in this, uh, this orange uh, arrow here. Okay, so the processor is actually interconnected to the uh, system, or I mean to all the peripheral subsystems should address data and control bus. Okay, so the processor decides which device it talks to, which memory it talks to, uh, who controls the flow of the data and so on. Okay, and uh, of course, the processor is able to do that. And now with the DMA, you're also able to use the DMA to perform IO transfers. Okay, so it's something like a separate processor, but it doesn't have the full flash capability of a processor because it's only designed to do memory transfer for us. Okay, so what it allows us to do is, it allows us to sort of, uh, Segregate the responsibility okay, of memory transfer to the DMA while the processor can actually be running other processes. Okay, so 
The processor doesn't have to wait around and do memory transfer. The DMA can do it for us. Okay, so for the DMA, what we need to do is we need to set up some things. So we need to say, okay, where do I uh, want to read from? Where do I want to write to? How many bytes and so on? Okay. So for example, okay, uh, let me give you a simple example. Let's just say this is my memory here. Okay. And let's just say I have one megabyte of data. And I want to move from this address 0x a 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 to this address 0 x c 0 0 0 0 0 I want to move one megabyte of data from this address starting at a 0 0 0 all the way to starting at c 0 0 0 so this is one megabyte of data a lot of data all right so what I need to do is I need to tell the DMA controller okay I want to read from this location this is a starting address this is the destination address, I want to read a total of one megabyte and so on. Okay, so that is the setup we need to do. Okay, so that takes some time. So in this case, we just say maybe 1000 nanosecond. And after I do the setup, all I need to do is I just say start. I don't need to write any code to do the data transfer because the entire data transfer is handled by the hardware in the background. Okay, so the DMA controller, the moment I say start, what happens is the DMA controller will take over and perform all this data transfer for me in the background. Okay, and what it will do is when it is done, it can generate an interrupt to tell me that, hey, I've completed the data transfer uh, and now you can take over the bus again. So the interrupt again, maybe take some time. So the total amount of time in this case is again, very, very little, 1,000 nanosecond, it will take 60 clock cycles. Okay, so of course, this 60 clock cycles is only the actual time you need to sort of execute some instructions on the processor. You still need additional clock cycles because there is data transfer happening at the back end. But then those clock cycles we don't consider because the processor is still free to do other things while this memory transfer is going on in the background. Okay, so these 60 clock cycles are the only time where you need the processor to execute some instructions to do the setup and handle the interrupt. Other than that, everything else is actually in the background. Okay, so that is where a DMA is very powerful, okay, uh, to handle a lot of this uh, heavy lifting, okay, of, of memory transfer while you are busy doing other things. Okay, so that is the DMA. Again, the DMA is not available on the Nmega328, okay, but higher end controllers you have it. Okay, now let's look at the same sort of question, okay, but with um, smaller block size. So just now uh, we were looking at it as moving 16 kilobytes of data. Okay, but now assume that I only have uh, a block size of eight bytes. I only want to move eight bytes. Okay, if I take the same approach. Okay, so what are the disadvantages of using DMA? Okay, since it is faster, there's a question here. Actually, this question answers that. Okay, so let's look at this question, then you'll get the answer. If you look at this, if I just have eight bytes, okay, if I stick with the same timing and everything, between each byte is still 60 cycles, all right, and the time wasted is, total is eight times 60, which is 480 cycles. Okay, if I use interrupt, and I still need two and a half cycle per byte of transfer, Okay, for eight bytes, I need 20 cycles. All right, so in terms of polling and interrupts, okay, it's sort of, uh, you can relate it directly to the number of bytes you're dealing with. Okay, but if I want to use a DMA for this, I still need to use the same thousand cycle to do a setup and another 200 cycle for interrupt. Okay, it's thousand 200 cycle. All right, so the key takeaway here is that the DMA works Okay, when you have large chunks of data. Okay, so for example, you plug in a thumb drive and you want to copy one very large media file, okay, from your hard disk to the thumb drive. Okay, so that is where a DMA comes in and can, can do all this background work for you. Okay, but for small amounts of data, okay, that can happen uh, frequently or infrequently, you use interrupts. Okay, so that is why, for example, your mouse, your keyboard, all of these actually use interrupts to 
get attention from the processor to process the data that it receives. Okay, whereas when you talk about large chunks of memory move from your hard disk to the thumb drive or things like that, your DMA comes in. Okay, so the DMA is always useful only when you have large chunks of data. Okay, if you just have small block sizes, it is still more efficient to just use interrupts. Okay, so question six. So question six is on interrupt masking. Okay, so what is interrupt masking? That means you want to uh, disable interrupts. Okay, so how can I enable or disable interrupts? All right, so in, in our code, we saw the SEI and CLI instructions. Okay, and that actually translates to the setting of the I bit in the S reg. Okay, so the S register or status register is a register within the controller. Okay, uh, so this. Uh, when you learn assembly language, you look at all this. So these are all the what we call the uh, output flex of the uh, arithmetic uh, operations that you do. Okay, so remember this is overflow flag, negative, zero, carry, and so on. Okay, uh, of course we don't look at this now, uh, but when you are when you are learning assembly language program, you look at this. Okay, at the same time you have the I bit over here, which is to uh, operate the or activate the interrupt. So when we use CLI and SEI, we are actually configuring this IB. Okay. And by using CLI, you are disabling interrupt. And we say SEI, okay, we are enabling interrupts. Okay. So why do I want to do that? Okay. Why would I want to uh, mask interrupts? Okay. Because we just talked about interrupts and we say it's very efficient. Okay. But why would I want to mask interrupts? Okay. So sometimes, we want to execute some code, which is what we call atomic. Okay, what is atomic? Atomic means, okay, that means if, let's say this is my code. Okay, the moment I start, I want to make sure I end it without any interruption. Okay, the whole idea of in interrupts is at any point of time, anything can happen, correct? And I, I have to stop what I'm doing to go to the interrupt, okay? finish the interrupt and come back. That is the whole idea of interrupt. But there could be some sections of code which we call atomic, uh, where I do not want this. I do not want this. Okay, I do not want to be interrupted. So what I can do is I can disable interrupt. So I can do a CLI before that, okay? And then do a SCI after that. So what will happen is entire section over here, I will not have any interrupts. All right. Uh, again, uh, this is also quite common when the system initially boots up. All right. So you don't want to have interrupts uh, affecting the, the, the process while you are booting up or starting up a system. All right. So again, we will look at this later on in other studios as well. Okay. So this gives you an example of what we call uh, masking of the interrupts okay, using this atomic. Okay, so in this case, okay, you don't need to worry about the code, but we're just trying to highlight the case where we say make atomic and exit atomic. Okay, so in this case, you is equivalent to saying that I disable interrupt, okay, and I enable interrupt. All right. Uh, of course, um, uh, when we talk about uh, multitasking and, and uh, multi-threaded programming, then the other ways or other techniques to manage this idea of atomic uh, operation okay which we will again study in another module okay but for now if i have some part of the code which i do not want to be interrupted then i can disable and enable before and after okay so at the same time okay while we have interrupts okay and we and as we saw we can enable the interrupt or we can disable interrupts there are also things which we call non-maskable interrupts. Okay, non-maskable interrupts means you have no option. Okay, you can't use software to override the behavior and say you do not want to service the interrupt. You it will happen, and you have to handle it. Okay, uh, of course, the most common one is a reset button. Okay, your reset button or power button that is tied to the, the, the reset vector is non-maskable. That means the moment you press the reset button you will have to reset your processor, okay? Uh, there could be also other pins, okay, which are non-maskable, which you can use 
to tell the system to perform some activity before, uh, if you know that it's going to approach some critical stage. Okay, one example is, for example, uh, using a UPS. So UPS is an uninterruptible power supply. Okay, uh, so that is like what you see over here. Okay, it can cost like a few hundred dollars to even a few thousand dollars, depending on uh, how much power output you want. Okay, and how long you want this battery to last. Okay, so this is usually used uh, in cases, for example, where you have uh, hardware systems which you want it to keep running for a certain number of hours, uh, even if there's a power failure. Okay, so it has a built-in battery, okay, that is always charged up. So in case there is some power failure or anything, this battery can still sustain the system. Okay, but what happens if it is reaching the end of its battery life and yet the power is not restored? Okay, so you know the system is going to fail. Okay, so what you can program the device to do is that the, the UPS power supply can be programmed to trigger this non maskable interrupt. Okay, so when the microcontroller or the system receives this uh, interrupt, it knows that it is uh, or this situation is or this event is going to happen, then it can go ahead and do uh, the critical task. Okay, like maybe doing all the backup of data, uploading of uh, information and things like that before the whole system shut down. Okay, so that is what you call non maskable interrupt. Okay. Uh, so, okay, maybe I'll show that in the. Where is the table? Okay, so. Uh, okay, never mind. Uh, I'll find for that table later, I'll show you. Okay, so let's go on to this question here first. Uh, interrupts on the AT to do AP. So, what are the interrupt request lines available? Okay, so the interrupt lines that we saw, okay, in class are these two. Okay, interrupt zero and interrupt one. Okay, these are the two interrupt pins that we saw. Okay, but at the same time, there are 23 pin change interrupt request lines. Okay, pin change interrupt request lines. So, you have a lot of these other, you can see here PC interrupt 13, 12, you know, uh, 9, 8, all this. So these are the pin change interrupt request lines. Okay, so you have two sort of sets of interrupt requests that you can handle. Of course, interrupt 0 and interrupt 1 are much more flexible. Okay, so if you remember from the data sheet, okay, in the studio, you can actually capture different types of signals. That means I can capture just a low signal, I can capture a high signal, I can capture a transition high to low, uh, low to high or high to low. So I can capture um, any uh, different types of signals to trigger the interrupt, okay, depending on how I configure these bits over here. All right, whereas the, uh, and the other advantage is each of them have their own interrupt service routine that you can write. Okay, so inside uh, your controller, all right, uh, in the studio, you only use one interrupt, right? So I can actually use both at the same time also, doesn't matter. So I can have one interrupt tied to one uh, switch, another interrupt tied to another switch, okay? And depending on uh, how I configure the switch and so on, each of them can trigger an interrupt and each of it will jump to its own uh, vector or interrupt service routine. Okay, so each of it has its own interrupt service routine. Okay, so I can choose to do different things depending on whether int zero is triggered or int one is triggered. All right, for the other pins, they only respond to changes in voltage level. Okay, so either zero to one or one to zero. So as long as the voltage level changes, it responds. Okay, and the thing is they are grouped uh, into uh, three different interrupts. Okay, so INT0, INT1, INT2, all right? So you have many, many pins, but they all group together, okay, to trigger a particular uh, ISR. Okay, so you only have three different ISR for these 23 lines. Okay, so of course it's not so desirable, okay, because uh, you may not know which device is the one that actually triggered it. So you need to do additional uh, layers of checking to see if that particular interrupt is triggered but actually which line triggered it, you do not know yet, okay? So that is why it's not so uh, ideal. So in most cases, if you are dealing with external interrupts, 
Okay, it is always easier to just use uh, int zero or int one. Okay, so just now uh, in the earlier question, we talk about what actually happens, all right, when the interrupt is triggered. Okay, the ISR. So the ISR, uh, when the interrupt is triggered, okay, basically what happens is each interrupt line is actually assigned an index number. Okay, so that is handled within the controller itself. Okay, and what it does is the interrupt request line is actually monitored by the processor uh, very frequently to know whether it is being activated. Okay, and once it sees that the line is uh, activated, okay, it takes notes of the index number. Okay, so again, all this is internal to the processor. We do not see this. Okay, it's internal to the design of the processor and the controller. Okay, but once it detects that a line has been triggered, it also takes note of the index number that triggered the line. Okay, and once it knows the line, it will consult what is called the interrupt vector table. Okay, based on the index number that it receives. Okay, so what happens is, all right, when you trigger the interrupt, okay, so let's say now uh, INT0 is triggered. Okay. What happens is it needs to stop whatever it is doing, all right, and jump to this line over here, uh, or jump to this address over here, okay, which is address 0002, okay, which is the uh, vector location for INT0. But what is inside this? What is inside this? Okay, inside each of this uh, vector location, is the is, is it the code is, is this the place where you store the interrupt service routine that you write okay we know that there is isr associated with the interrupt that we are dealing with okay so let me come back here uh, Just give me a minute, huh? let me just update that slide to make this easier. Uh, okay, so. Okay, so now what I have here is a copy of the code. Now here is, this is the ISR that you have written, okay, for INT0, okay? So it, is this code actually coming and being stored in this location over here? All right, now to answer this question is very easy. You just look at the space you have between one interrupt and another interrupt. It's just two addresses only. Okay, just two address locations. That means each vector is only two address locations. Now, what if your code is very long? Can it fit into just two address locations? Not possible. Correct? So it doesn't make sense that your code is actually stored in this location here. So what is actually stored in this location? Okay, so if I go to the memory location, and I go to this address 0x0002, what will I see here? Okay, what I will see here is an instruction, okay, that says jump to a particular address. And what address? It is the address of where this is in the memory. Okay, when I compile this code, okay, when I compile this code, all right, what will happen is this code over here will be stored somewhere in memory. Okay, we do not know where it is. Okay, because when your code changes, this location will change. All right, it's not absolute. Okay, it's always relative to the rest of the code you're writing. Okay, so let's assume that this ISR INT0 is mapped to an address called 0x8000. Okay, so that is the address location where this code is, okay? So the starting address of this ISR is 0x8000. 
But I know that this is an interrupt service routine mapped to INT0 because I specify it as INT0 back. Okay, so what happens is when I compile the code, okay, the compiler will first allocate a memory for all of this code. So it will know that the code for this INT0 is in this address location, 0x8000. Okay, then what happens? Then it will take this address location and add it over here. Okay, so what you see in this address location, which is the interrupt vector entry for INT0 is an instruction to jump to where the ISR is located. Okay, so when the interrupt happens, when the interrupt happens, I will jump to this location here. Why I will jump to this location? Because I will, when the interrupt happens, I also know the index number of the interrupt. So the index number will tell me that this is the interrupt for INT0. Okay, so when the interrupt happens, I will jump to the correct vector location for INT0, which is 0002. And inside this address 0002, I will actually have another instruction that says jump to where the interrupt service routine is located, which is here. And over here is where I have this code. So I'll execute the ISR, okay, through this sequence of events. Okay, so that is how the microcontroller is able to respond and execute the correct ISR, okay, when a particular event happens. So it doesn't matter where this code is because this code can, can go to a different address. It doesn't have to be 8000. Okay, it can be any address. But when I compile the code, the compiler will take the address and put it as part of the jump instruction in that correct location in the vector table. Okay, so you know, in the next studio this week, when you talk about timer interrupts and so on, there's the same thing that will happen because I will label it as ISR timer zero back or timer one back. Okay, so that ISR will, will have a particular address, but that address will again be updated in the correct entry in the uh, vector table. Okay, so it knows exactly where to go to when a particular event happens. Okay, so that is the whole flow of how the interrupt is sort of handled and managed by the controller. Okay, uh, so what exactly happens? Okay, it does a few things, all right? Um, okay, so I think this is a better way to do it. Okay, so as you can see, prior to the interrupt, Okay, prior to the interrupt, you are, I will just say you're in the main loop. Okay, you are just doing something. All right, but the moment the interrupt happens, okay, you know that you need to uh, service the interrupt, correct? So when I need to service the interrupt, I need to perform some background work. Okay, which is basically to finish up what I was doing. Okay, so the first thing is I need to finish up what I was doing. So, okay, so I need to save the context of the program counter onto the process stack. Okay, so this concepts and all may be a bit uh, complex to fully understand right now, but basically what you need to understand is when I'm running my main loop code here, okay, what is happening? That means I have some variables that I'm dealing with. Okay, I have some registers with some values, register seven, register six, and so on. So I'm, I'm using some variables, some registers. I'm at a particular line in my code, which is pointed to by what you call my program counter. Okay, but now I have an interrupt. So I need to first finish the instruction that I was doing, and I need to save the context. Okay, so I need to save context. Okay, so when I say save context, what does that mean? That means I need to take all the information that I have and what we call push it onto a stack, a local stack or a, pro a process stack. So what is a stack? A stack is just, a, you can think of it as just a section of the memory that I can use to hold some information for me. Okay, so it, it is just like, uh, it, it's just like you're, you're using your laptop, all right? So if you are in the middle of typing an email, all right, and then you 
decide to abandon it halfway to do something else, you can save it as a draft. And then later you come back and carry on, correct? So that is the same concept. That means you are in the midst of doing something, you haven't finished, but you need to do something else. Okay, so you, you save this information somewhere. All right, so that's what we call the context, saving the context. All right, and after that, okay, and besides the information of what you're doing, also where, uh, what, what uh, address or what instruction you're executing. And so that is in the program counter. All right, after that is done, you need to load the address of the ISR into the PC. So the address of the ISR into the PC is what I mentioned here. Okay, so when you say that you jump to the interrupt vector table first, okay, to fetch this address, then you need to update this address. So the program counter must be updated with this address, which is the address of the ISR. Then it can start to execute the interrupt service routine. Okay, the program counter is just a register that keeps track of the address of the instruction you're executing. Okay, so when I come here, I need to load the address of the ISR in the PC. So once that happens, I actually can execute the code. Okay, so this is the part where the program counter is loaded with the ISR. Okay, and then you can start to execute the code. Now, once I finish the whole ISR code, Okay, what is that? That means I jump to the ISR over here. Okay, ISR, I finish everything and then I need to come back, correct? I need to come back and carry on from where I left off. So when I want to come back, I need to restore the CPU. That means all of this information here must be loaded back again. Okay, that means I need to take the information from the stack and update all my variables again. Because I need to know exactly where I left off. Right, that is what we call restoring the context. Okay, and once that is done, then I can continue running. Okay, so that is what we call uh, the whole interrupt processing sequence. All right, so the ISR ends with a return from interrupt instruction. Okay, of course, this instruction we don't see in the C code. Okay, but this is the assembly language code. Okay, so the assembly language, okay, when you finish the interrupt, there is actually a return of interrupt instruction. So when the processor executes this instruction, it automatically does this restore for you. Okay, exactly where I left off, what I need to do, where I need to, uh, how do I update the PC and everything. Okay, so everything is done in the background for us. Okay, so the, the processor and the controller manages all of this in the background. Okay, we just need to focus on the higher end application, correct? The main code, the ISR, and setting up the ISR. Okay, so the last part here is nested interrupts. Okay, so this concept is what if you have uh, in the process of one interrupt and then another interrupt happens? All right, so by default, interrupts have priority levels. So when a new interrupt uh, occurs, the controller okay, uh, will look at the, the index number right? and then know whether it is a lower priority or higher priority. If the new interrupt is lower priority, then you ignore it until the current interrupt completes. But if the new interrupt is higher priority, then the same sequence can happen. Okay, that means, for example, if in my, in my main code, I'm running an interrupt occurs. So I mean my interrupt service routine, but before I finish, another higher priority interrupt comes in. So this is low priority and this is high priority. Okay, so I can interrupt my current interrupt to go to another higher priority one, finish it, come back here, finish it, and then come back here and so on. All right, so this is also a possible sequence. Okay, and that is what we call the nested interrupts. Okay, the nested interrupts. Okay, so this gives you an example of the idea of nested interrupts. Okay, how uh, does this relate? Okay, so as you can see over here, your ISR1 gets interrupted by ISR2 and ISR3. So when I finish ISR3, I go back to ISR2, and finish ISR2, go back to ISR1, and I finally go back to my main loop. Okay, now in, in the Ad Mega 328, okay, what is the default behavior? The default behavior is, the moment I jump to an interrupt service routine, the IB is clear. 
Okay, this is an automatic behavior or configuration within the controller itself. So the moment the first interrupt happens, okay, so if I'm running in my main code here, okay, the first interrupt happens, what happens is I disable interrupts. So I, it's equivalent to saying I execute the CLI. Okay, so I by right, I cannot have any more interrupts, but you are still free to execute the SCI instruction inside the interrupt. Okay, so if I do that, then I setting the I bit, I bit back. So I allow nested interrupt. Okay, but if I don't do this, then by default, you do not allow nested interrupts. Okay, so again, this is configurable depending on whether you want or you do not want nested interrupts. Okay, so that sort of uh, brings us to the end uh, of the tutorial. Um, yeah, so I know it's quite a lot of stuff and some of it is new. Uh, and sometimes you don't have questions immediately, you know, when you're sleeping tonight and suddenly you wake up in the middle of the night and then you realize, hey, what happens if I do this or do that? So take note of your questions, all right? Uh, and you're always free to discuss with me um, uh, any point of time, okay, in the studios. Okay, uh, if you think you're still not sure of any of the concepts that we discussed here. Okay, so before we end, uh, uh, one more thing. Uh, so usually I like to discuss something that is always uh, some value add to you. All right, so let's uh, just spend a few minutes, all right, uh, okay, to look at the data sheet of the Arduino Uno and try to learn something. Okay, so each week I hope we can spend some time, okay, to learn something. Maybe different, okay, or something that you're not aware of, okay. Um, so if you look at the data sheet, okay. Uh, so of course we, in most cases, when we look at data sheet, okay, we power it, we power the Arduino Uno using the uh, power USB cable. Okay, so usually we use the USB cable, but at the same time we have the black connector over here. Okay, the one where we can use to. <laughs> plug in the power uh, to the, 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 the cable slot there. Okay, so if when I plug in through this cable, okay, uh, we know that if I use the USB, it uh, by default is always five volts. Okay, so you don't need to worry about that. But when I plug in using this, okay, you may use a battery pack that is nine volts, uh, seven volts, 10 volts, and so on. Okay, so there must be a way for the uh, board to, make sure that you only get the correct voltage, all right? Even though you may plug in a higher voltage. Okay, so that is this part of the circuit over here. So as you can see over here, what is happening is, so this is basically the black connector, okay, that you see there, all right? And there is a power that comes out, okay? And it passes through this device here, this component called the triple one seven. Can, can you all go and do a Google and find out what is this triple one seven? What is this component? What does it do? Okay, and put it in the chat. Okay, what is this triple one seven IC chip there doing for us? Okay, so as yes, some of you got it, it is basically a regulator. Yeah, not sure. No, no. So this is the one triple one seven. So it's basically a regulator chip. So what is a regulator? So if you go and download the data sheet, okay. Uh, basically, what it tells you is it it is basically a regulator that can be designed, okay, or used to provide fixed output voltages, okay, for your circuit. So the triple one seven is basically designed to provide you with a fixed five volt output. So at the input side, you can have uh, seven volts, nine volt, 10 volt, doesn't matter. Okay, but the output side is always a fixed plus five volt. Okay, another IC chip or another chip that does it is also called 7805. You can also search for this. Okay, so 7805 is also another very popular voltage regulator chip. Okay, where it's similar, it's a three pin device. 
okay, where you can provide any input and you can get another fixed output. And they have variations. So for example, you can have 7809. Okay, so that will give you a fixed nine volt output and so on. Okay, so if you have a circuit, all right, uh, and you are providing a power with a battery pack, all right, a power bank. Okay, so the power bank may have a fixed voltage, but your circuit that you design, some part of the circuit may require 3.3 volt, some part of the circuit may require 5 volts and so on. Okay, so this kind of voltage regulators are the ones that can help you to take a common power and split up into different fixed voltages that different part of your circuits may require. Okay, so that is where these kind of voltage regulators come uh, very useful for you. Okay, so that is something that I just wanted to highlight for today. Okay, and maybe uh, next tutorial we can explore something else. Okay. So that sort of brings us to the end uh, of today's uh, tutorial. Uh, if you have any questions, you can ask me. Uh, if not, thank you. And uh, next studio on uh, Thursday is graded. Okay, so please make sure you uh, come prepared so it'll be easier for you. Okay, so thank you very much. I will see you all on uh, Thursday in the lab. Thank you, Prof. Uh, hi, Prof. Yeah. Uh, sorry, can I clarify? Regarding the first question, right, the two uh, X toes, right? The crystals, right? Uh, so the Arduino, basically that 16 megahertz, that timer, is connected to these two crystals, and the they and megahertz, they provide the the 16 megahertz crystal is that that the shiny thing just now I showed you. Yeah, the that metal piece, right? Yeah, yes, and that is connected to do, to these two pins, crystal one and crystal two. So this this creates the uh like clock system uh, for the. Sorry. Correct. So this clock is—is is it the same as like you know our CPU like our our yeah. clock speed? Is it the same? Same. Also. Okay. So, so every processor you need to have some some clock. And uh, so in this case the board here uses the sixteen uh, megahertz clock. Oh, okay, okay. Then uh, I was thinking so. In the event like, if I'm using. X to one, X to two for something else, right? Like question one, they asked whether we can use it for something mm. else. Mm. Then how, how would that work? That, that would interrupt the timer function, is it? No, no. So that's why you need to go and change the clock settings. So there is some there's a register, okay, uh, for clock register set for clock selection, and you need to select, uh, for example, internal clock. Okay. So if you do that, then it will not depend on the those two pins as the clock. You will use the internal clock. Oh, okay, okay. But so then you you were saying something about the values for timing related features will be affected. So yeah. that's because of we changed the from yeah. the crystal clock to this interrupt clock. Correct. So the the frequency changes then. So like whatever timing we set, like delays all that will be affected. Is it? Yeah. I mean, whatever that is that you have. Uh, program based on an earlier clock. You know? So for example, if you decided to do some sampling, you know, and you configured uh, the registers to sample at a particular frequency based on 16 megahertz, but then now you change to internal clock, then uh, those settings need to be changed as well. Okay, okay. okay thank you. Prof, so like, if let's say we want to use the millis function, right? Mm. So if we change the clock and we use the millis function, will it still output the same? Will it still have the same output? Uh, okay, so the by the Arduino libraries and all, okay, those millis function and all, uh, by default, what happens is uh, the it assumes that you're using the actual Arduino board. Yeah. Okay, so uh, if you use the original board, then those functions will still work correctly. Okay, but if now you change to a different board or a different frequency, then you need to change some settings there. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, so in the, in the uh, library code, you need to update some settings to change, to say that you are using a different clock frequency. Okay, thanks. Yeah.
Um, prof, can I ask like for four B right? Like, um, why is it that we never add the like the answer is like forty thousand nine hundred sixty cycle? Why is it that we never add the eight one nine two zero zero from part A? Because this 819200 is based on you waiting in the while loop. This is the time that you spend waiting in the while loop, correct? Right? Because you spend 50 clock cycles per check. Okay, so in the interrupt mode, you are not waiting anymore because you can just write your main loop to, to just do whatever you want to do. You know, so you don't have to factor that anymore. You only focus on the actual time you take to execute the interrupt service routine. Oh, I see. Thank you. I'll see you all on Thursday. Bye.